there's three rookies on the grid this year. There's a lot for them to get used to. Formula One cars are so complex and so many of those complexities lie with this, the steering wheel. It's something they're going to have to get up to speed with very, very quickly. So they'll already be used to uh, many of the buttons from Formula 2, which they've all graduated from. You've got the team radio, the pit lane speed limiter. This will be the DRS on the top left and the overtake button, the deployment of the energy in race conditions. These are pretty much the most commonly used and that's why they're situated in those positions. This is Fernando Alonso's layout for, for Alpine. He's got them exactly where, when you're holding the wheel, you can access those ones very, very easily. So they're the ones that the, the rookie drivers will already know, but there's so much more on here. There's gadgets everywhere that the drivers are gonna to have to get up to speed with. The next ones really are performance tools. Unlike in Formula Two, in Formula One, you can tune your car around the lap and it makes a huge difference to performance. And there's four different areas you can do this. You've got mid, entry, and then you've got more neatly on this, you've got the high speed, and the, uh, the exit up there. But you can see from here what Fernando's more likely going to be using, diff mid and the diff entry. And these, you can just really isolate the areas of the, of the corner where you want the diff to just drop and give you some rotation or stay locked and help you uh, keep stability in the car. On top of this, the braking is very, very important in Formula One cars and it's more powerful again than Formula Two. And there's more you can do with it than Formula Two. You've got brake maps. Break by wire means you can control for how much pressure you get different amounts front and rear. And uh, Fernando's got his brake shape here and he can adjust that on the fly with this rotary. On top of that, he's got brake balance up here. So you can change the overall balance rather than the actual shape of the map, depending on, uh, on what you want and corner to corner as well. So you might notice apart from the DRS, which would be labeled there, we've got two more blank ones down here. And on the back, you can see the upshift, the downshift, the clutch paddles, but also these two levers. And these are big adjusts. So these are left basically blank and you can preset on here what you want uh, as a driver for various corners. So after FP2, FP3, the drivers get an idea of what they want from the car in particular corners. So they might know they come into turn eight, for example, in Bahrain, it's downhill. The rear is always locking a bit more. They can preset that they want to move the brake bias forward. They want to lock the diff a little bit more and they can do it all with a click of one of these big adjusters or maybe the push of that button down there. And all that means you've got quite a powerful tool around the lap. And that's something that Formula 2 graduates are going to have to really get used to because there is a lot of performance in it. And if you can get used to dialing all these uh, details in around the lap, you can find a bit of time. Of course, it's hard work though. You can imagine they're driving flat out you've got to put the final tenth into your own driver performance, let alone start fiddling with all these switches around the lap. So there's a balance to be had probably between absolute performance and honing it for every single corner and actually just driving around with what you've got a little bit more, but working on your own sim simple things like the braking, the throttle application. And if you get one of these wrong and you're in the wrong switch at the wrong time, you can find a nasty surprise at the next corner. And you can see there's so much more as well than uh, just those performance aspects that I run through and the staples on the top. You've got all this big rotary, this multifunction switch, which is full of absolute detail. You've got fail A and fail B. Now these are things that you hope you won't have to use as you're in, in a, a whole season maybe, but from time to time, the engineers will pass on the information during a race that, okay, you need to use fail A, X, X now. Fail one, fail Max, fail one, fail. So the drivers would have to go bam, flick through with these plus and minus to find the right one on the dash and press OK to confirm their fail A. They're basically control alt deleting their own problem from the car now. It's quite clever, but it's hard work for the drivers to do this. It's a lot of switch changes and uh, they're still driving flat out normally in the middle of race conditions when they're doing this. So that bit's particularly tough particularly for the engine. The energy management is the big one now and controlling the amount of energy in the battery at any given time is also the job of the driver. You want to have enough state of charge in the battery so you can deploy it all with that overtake button when you're uh, looking to overtake or defend from another driver. There's the recharge button on here. That's predominantly for recharging before a qualifying lap or a one-off big one. But there's also different modes that you can have, and that's this scenario switch, which the drivers will change to if they want to slowly recharge the battery over a number of laps. 
or perhaps they want to put in four fast ones, they'll deploy a bit of energy through that run as well. All in all, a huge amount to, uh, to try and get up to speed with. And for the rookies, they'll be given a manual of this. It's pretty simple at the start of the season. They need to get up to speed with it. Stoffel van Dorn made his debut here. He had really short notice and he, he literally read the manual on an overnight flight from Japan so he could get up to speed. If you don't know where these switches are, you could end up looking pretty silly. Approaching turn nine. He's, let's see if he looks down on his steering wheel before he... Yeah, a bit embarrassing. I think uh, he's not going to be looking down on his steering wheel during the corners anymore, is he? So there's, a, there's other stuff on here as well that's predominantly used for testing. You've got aero speed runs. You've got your uh, delta times on here as well when there's a safety car or an in-lap from qualifying. And you can switch to those on this multifunction switch. Now this is Fernando Alonso's steering wheel from Alpine, but it happens to be the same steering wheel as I used back in 2016 at Renault. The rate of steering wheel development isn't that great. And effectively, what's been on there is all the same. With the same technology on the cars, there's not a lot more that can be done to the steering wheels. There are differences though across the team. Some will have extra buttons on the back or paddles in different places. And some drivers would want to uh, have their switches in certain places as well. For example, Daniel Ricciardo was in the Renault last year. He's moved to McLaren. He'll be taking probably a lot of what he had at Renault to McLaren. And probably that was from what he had at Red Bull as well. Just because your driver's memory, you're driving along. You don't want to have to start thinking about new switch positions, extra things to do when you're driving a Formula One car at the absolute peak of its performance.